Sports has given me so many gifts. It's given me the ability to explore my own courage, to explore my own resiliency, and to cultivate gratitude to those who have encouraged me throughout my journey towards the Olympic Games. Sports has definitely helped me in my life. It helped to alleviate stress and anxiety. Thank God for my football team that I got to get up and work out and get rid of some stress. Sport has always been a huge part of my life. On the days that I was feeling most down, soccer was there to motivate me to get out of my bed and get moving. Whenever I didn't want to go to practice, my mom would always remind me how much better I would feel afterwards. Sports are my motivator, and I always feel stronger, both mentally and physically, after participating. For me, sports, um, its impact on my mental and physical health has meant a lot of different things for me. In the midst of this pandemic, we're always sitting around the screen, whether that be for work, school, or meetings. I find that it has been beneficial to me engage in activities and collaborate with the students among this difficult time, as well as working on our team building, as well as our social and emotional bond through tennis. Sports, and especially tennis, has meant the world to me throughout my life, keeping me fit both physically and mentally. And especially during these times, it's so vitally important. I'm happy that I can continue to play tennis with my kids, just like I played tennis with my parents and my grandparents. Sports has made me realize how interconnected physical and mental health are. I have developed a greater awareness of my own self through sports, which has helped me stay centered and balanced in my own life. And by developing greater self-awareness through sports, I've grown as an individual and learned the importance of self-love and acceptance. I don't know where I would be without sport today. Sports has given me so much, and it's very important for mental health, physical health, and overall well-being. So come on, guys, get involved in sports. Get your mind right. Let's go. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I want to thank all of the young women who participated in the opening video um, and got this event started. We really appreciate hearing from our ambassadors and our coaches. Um, good afternoon and welcome to UPTA Sports Virtual Celebration in honor of National Girls and Women in Sports Day started by the Women's Sports Foundation. We at UPTA Sports in partnership with Adidas value the contributions of women and girls in sports from players to coaches to administrators and organizational leaders, what we bring to sport is undeniable power and poise, grit and grace, knowledge and know-how. February 3rd was officially National Girls and Women's and Women in Sports Day. So hopefully you all got a chance to attend some of the fabulous events put on by some of the most influential people and organizations in the sports world who celebrated girls and women all over the world. Today, we're gonna to continue that celebration. This year's theme is the impact of sports on the mental and physical health and well-being of women and girls. I wanna thank you, um, all the women who participated in that video montage, who spoke so eloquently about how sports affected their lives, both physically and mentally. My name is Dr. Ahada McCummings, and I'm the National Director of External Affairs here at Up to Us Sports. And today's event will be a roundtable discussion with a number of prominent young women who have and continue to dedicate themselves to the world of sports, but also have some knowledge and can shed some light on the things that women and girls go through that sometimes have a profound impact on their physical and mental health and well being. So, joining the virtual table today, is up to us sports coach with the LA Dodgers Foundation RBI program, Coach Violeta Aguilera. We have founder and CEO of the Women's National Football Conference, Director of Business Development for Parity, and up to us sports ambassador, Miss Odessa Jenkins. The title holder in the Miss New York organization and U11 soccer coach with South Bronx United, Miss Sydney Park. We have seasoned up to us sports virtual event panelists and student athlete at Oakland Lacrosse Club in Oakland, California, Ms. Molly Pham. And WNBA champion and all-star up to us sports ambassador and the author and of the soon to be best-selling book, They Better Call Me Sugar, My Journey from the Hood 
to Hardwood, Miss Sugar Rogers. Um, ladies, welcome. And I want to jump right in with some statistics to get us started, and then I'm going to kick it over to you all to, to sort of start the discussion. But according to some NCAA statistics, suicide was the third leading cause of death among student athletes, and female athletes are at a greater risk. Why? Because of the years of physical and mental pressure that sometimes goes along with sports. Sometimes the competitive nature of sports does not always allow the ability to show vulnerability on the field, on the court. And so we see athletes struggling to deal with issues such as depression or anxiety um, that may arise. So I'm gonna toss it out to the group and I wanna start with you, Sugar, because you are playing at the highest level of the game. You are a WNBA player, a professional player. So you've gone through this for years and I'm sure have seen teammates and yourself who may have had some depression and anxiety and things that happen just as a natural part of life and as a student athlete and as an athlete. And so I wanna start with you. If you can just jump in and just, and just talk a little bit about your experience with, with physical and mental struggles that happen in sports. Okay, so like I'll just share a moment like I had in college when I was kind of ignorant to the fact of seeing a therapist. Um, I grew up in a culture culture where seeking a therapist is, is pretty much taboo. Um, people call you crazy when you wanna take care of your mental health problems or issues. Um, and my mom as a young kid always made it clear like what goes on in this house stays in this house. And I kind of stood by that code until I went to college and I became knowledgeable of my own mental health problems. Um, my coach recommended that I see a therapist because he knew I had a lot of childhood trauma um, and it was affecting my everyday life, whether it was grades, my relationship with people and my work ethic. Um, basketball has always been a safe haven for me ever since my mom passed away in 2014. And I personally didn't know how to grieve because I was in survival mode when I became homeless. So when I got to Georgetown, it was a culture shock, um, a predominantly white school, uh, academically challenging. And um, I didn't understand why people at Georgetown wanted to help me or why people wanted to be nice. Um, they wanted me to succeed in life and that was difficult to accept coming from where I come from. Um, it was a totally opposite. So when I went to see a therapist, I was able to discover like who I was on the inside and it, it made me confident It made me secure in who I was as a person. So it improved my interactions with people as well. So I was able to think positive thoughts. And to be honest, like basketball saved my, saved my life. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, anybody else jump, jump right in, jump right in. Thank you for sharing that. First of all, thank you for being vulnerable enough to share that with us. Um, and I think it's a great way for us to sort of feel safe in this space and, and, um, and, and feel good about sharing our own experiences. And, and with that being said, I sort of want to remove myself as moderator and insert myself as a mother, right? As a mother of female athletes, as a coach of female athletes, and really sit in this space as that less than a moderator. And, and so I appreciate that. Thank you, Sugar. You're welcome. Sugar, and to the other current athletes, and Violetta, I think you can speak to this too. Um, something that struck me about your story is the importance of your coach coming in to make this suggestion to you. And I was wondering if there are other experiences where a coach has done something or has not done something that has helped or didn't help. Um, and I think it's really important as youth coaches that we consider what we say have gravity and we can kind of affect our players' mental health in providing that kind of safe space. So I was just wondering to the other athletes on this panel, like what have coaches done for you in your experiences that has supported your mental health um, or has affected your mental health negatively? Yeah, I think for me, um, and yeah, thanks for sharing that, Sugar. Like it was super um, brave, um, but I think for me, the thing that um, reigns true that Sugar was talking about is how um, sports creates a community around women and girls um, that 
maybe we don't all get in our home life. We don't all get in other parts of our life. So I've heard some of the greatest athletes, particularly girls and women say that, so that sports saved their life. Every day I, I say football saved my life. Um, and I think it's because of the community and the, the, um, the love and the guidance and those kind of things that it immediately puts around you that everybody expects that you have because you're a high performing athlete, right? They expect that you have that structure and you have those things. Um, but when it come, puts around you when you're in college or high school, I remember uh, the first time I felt that community in sport was in high school. Uh, my high school basketball coach, Michael O'Connor. Um, he was the complete polar opposite of who I am. Uh, he is a, a Mormon white guy uh, from Utah. Uh, and I was a little black girl from South Central LA. And um, he was driving me home from a basketball practice. I used to bus, take two buses and a train to get to school. And he said, hey, let me take you home. And I was like, nah, nah, coach. <laughs> you, don't know, you don't know what you're saying. Um, I get on the bus and get on the train, I'm good. And he's like, no, let me take you home. And I remember the nervousness of getting in his car and the nervousness of trusting a man and how I um, really wasn't comfortable and how I went through a whole mental thing in my head and how the words he said and that he was always a man of his word and did exactly what he said he would do um, and told me that that's how people are supposed to treat you. Uh, and it took, it took a coach, it took a coach in a non-sport situation to be like, oh, this is what safe, this is what good looks like. And so for me, it wasn't on the field or on the court where I got that sort of mental switch about um, what healthy relationships look like. It was off the court. It was somebody willing to put themselves in danger to get me safely home um, that changed things for me. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because there's those safe spaces that get created for us within our sport, right? But then there's these other um, views about us, about who we are, about who we should be as female athletes, as female coaches, what we should look like, um, how we should act, how we should move through this sports world, right? Um, and so I wanna, I wanna ask Molly, cause Molly, I know as a young person, this is one of those things that you're sort of passionate about, about how we have those conversations about how others view us, our body image, what we should look like. Um, I know you're passionate about that. So, so I want you to jump in, jump in here and talk about what has that been like for you? You're in a sport lacrosse, you know, where people see that as, as, a, as a men's sport um, and that you're supposed to behave a certain way. That's an aggressive sport, right? But you and your teammates have had these lively conversations about what that means and, and what does it mean to be a feminine athlete or a masculine athlete? What is that even? Um, so I, I want you to jump in here a little bit and talk about what are those expectations outside of that support that we have within our own team um, that sort of filters in. Um, first, first thing, I want to um, highlight what Adessa said about how high school sports for her changed her life. And um, I wanted to say that playing high sports in high school right now is changing my life. It's continuing to change my life every day. Um, in that, again, like I have this safe community that I can depend on. Um, but as for body image and how that affects teenage teenagers these days, um, I've dealt with I've struggled a lot with my body image. I've struggled a lot with self-esteem and my confidence, self-love. Ever since I was nine, the first time I was body shamed by my mother because <laughs> um, she was concerned about my weight. And, you know, it's always, it's been engraved in so many people's mindsets. Um, and it's kept me away from sports until eighth grade because I was afraid of looking a certain way if I played sports, whether that be growing muscles, whether that be fast being faster than boys in my grade. Um, I wanted to feel accepted and I wanted to feel attractive. And 
taking that into consideration, I that's what really kept me away from um, wanting to do these things that made that make me happy now. And only was it introduced by um, coaches who actually came to my school and introduced the sport to us was when I started playing and starting to love the sport, like playing a sport in general. Um, but I feel like discussions and talking about it and learning about the factors that go into why we think these ways about ourselves and why we set these standards and um, these expectations and body ideals on our own bodies and, you know, taking our worth away, taking our own worth um, because we don't look a certain way. I think that what was a really big turning point was doing a research project for my ninth grade class and learning about the systems of oppression that um, on levels of, on the levels of internal, interpersonal and institutional. Um, on those levels of oppression was when I started to realize that it's all designed to make us feel this way. And it's all designed for companies to make money off of like anti-aging products of programs that tell us, oh, we can lose this much amount of weight in this amount of time. Um, and it just makes us feel like, oh, so in order to feel beautiful and to be beautiful, I have to look this certain way. Um, and playing like something else that goes into that, that I learned from this research product project <laughs> was how we're so consumed in the media these days, especially um, my generation and kids these days. We're surrounded by social media. We're surrounded by influencers who um, are gaining attention for looking a certain way, for being this ideal beauty standard. And that, that really impacted my health um, physically and mentally because I started taking actions in order to try and achieve these body ideals and these beauty standards. Um, I punished myself for not looking a certain way. And it wasn't until playing lacrosse is when I started developing such a healthy relationship with food um, and with my own self-love because being on a team, it's like you want to be dependable and you also want to depend on other people. And you can't, you know that you can't be dependable if you can't even depend on yourself. So being, playing sports um, and wanting to be there for your teammates and wanting to be strong on the field as an athlete, um, I feel like that set, this, that set the zone in motion to taking care of myself um, with what I consume on media and as well as what I consume for my body. Um, and I feel like that had, had the biggest and most impactful, impact, wait, the most <laughs> positive and important impact on my life right now. And I'm still dealing with it. I'm still struggling with it. But lacrosse has taught me so much and being on a team, playing sports, learning how to take care of myself and learning how to love myself. That's what sports, ha like playing sports have brought me to realize um, and also what I want to continue doing so that other girls and women won't have to feel this way about themselves anymore. Um, I know that. Yeah, I, Molly, I, you said something really important. And, and I, want, I want Sydney and Violetta to sort of chime in here as coaches because as a mother, right? As a mother of girl athletes, and I know you said, you know, you felt this sort of this body shaming that happened from your mom. And I have to take ownership of that as well as a mother that, you know, we see things for our daughters that we want for them. And we have to take ownership of the fact that how I speak about my own body gets interpreted by my kids. Um, so it's not even that I may have a completely open mind about my daughter's body and want her to love herself and accept herself. And I can tell her all of that. But what happens when I, as a mother, and saying while my daughter's in the room and I'm getting dressed and I'm making comments about my own body and how unhealthy I feel I am or how I look um, and all of that sort of infiltrates. And so it's good to have people like Violetta and Sydney, I want you guys to jump in here, who are coaches who can kind of counteract some of the stuff that parents do inadvertently um, or, or unconsciously, we don't even recognize that we're doing that's impacting our daughter's self-worth and self-image. Yeah, I can jump in here um, as a coach. I coach U11, which is such an interesting age group because U11 is really this 
transitional period where you're coming from being a young girl to being in your preteen years, where, where we see a huge drop off in the number of girls who participate in sports. And so having my hands and being able to have an impact on this age group is really important to be able to show them that this is something that they can continue to do and feel strong doing. So something that I have to make a conscious choice each day when I show up to the field is, how am I going to support my girls? How am I going to show up for them? Because just as they show up for me every Saturday, I have to make the conscious choice to show up for them. And so something that I always try and make sure that I'm doing when I'm on the field is I want to make sure that my girls know that what makes them great players is that they're working together. They're doing the things that I'm asking them to. It's not about how they look when they show up. It's about the things that they can do and what they can offer to this team and how they can work together because that for me is a beautiful part of sports. And that's where I hope that they gain their confidence from is you learned a new skill today that deserves praise. You scored a goal today that deserves praise. You helped your friend get off the field when she was hurt that deserves praise. So I think reinforcing the positive things that girls are already doing on their own and teaching them that those are the things that should give them fulfillment and satisfaction is a really powerful tool in supporting girls, especially at that young and transitional age. I totally agree. I want to say first, Molly, congratulations for being here. So young, it inspires me even more to see someone so young here talking, being brave to get more understanding of what we're trying to say. Like as me as a coach, I've been coaching <clears throat> for like roughly 10 years, um, as young as five to 18. And I've seen different attitudes coming in. You know, the ones that come in, I know it all, I could play this, I'm hard. Oh, <laughs> these girls don't know nothing. I make sure I make those girls the leaders. If they know it all, they're gonna be my leaders. They're gonna teach somebody that doesn't know something, something new. For me, like, when I go in, like she said, it's not only about them. I make sure they help me as well being out there coaching. They help me and they don't even know it. So sometimes when they come to me, they tell me, man, yes, you know, you did coach. I, I appreciate it, you know, on the side. And then I tell them, I want to thank you too, because you don't know what you did to me. You got me out here. You gave me inspiration. You made me want to come more and help you and see you help other girls and come together. And you know, the, even the ones that don't know how to play, bring them in, show them something. And like she said, praise them because the ones that are like, I can't do this, I can't do this. She's tough, she could do it. No, 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 even the littlest ones. I had a team two years ago and I had a little, a little one, a tiny one, Peaches. And she just blew everybody's mind because she was so little. This girl, it's crazy. We knew she was gonna hit a home run, she ran. A little hit like by second and she went up in third base and I was just telling everybody this is what it's all about it doesn't matter your size how you look how strong you are how buff you are you're a woman you could do it we're brave we're stronger than men <laughs> so it's it's nice that is so true I think one of my favorite stories from my very first season coaching was I had one of my girls, her little sister came and played for our team. She was about nine years old and she showed up. She's this itty bitty, tiny thing, very shy. Didn't want to say hello to anyone, barely came up to me, like was so nervous the entire time. And weekend after weekend after weekend, I pulled her and her sister aside and I said, here's what you guys did really well this week. Here's what you need to improve on for next week and we're going to get it. And weekend after weekend after weekend, they kept showing up and they kept improving until at the very end, she was coming up to me and she's like, okay, coach, I'm going to score a goal today. And I was like, yes, you are. And she did it most of the time, but the one time that she did by the end of the season, she was gone, so excited, so happy with the fact that she was able to do it. And that was just a really important moment for me as a coach. Yeah, so can I um, touch on that a little bit, Hada? Because oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a, there's a couple things that are said in there that I wanna I wanna hear from the other panelists, particularly um, Molly talked about being accepted and being attractive, and I think if we're talking about women and girls in sports, uh, particularly, um, we need to we need to stop and talk about the pressure of being attractive and the pressure of being accepted and how that affects you when you first come into a sport. So some of the uh, fact that girls are nervous is not even about whether or not they can play the sport is, is my uniform touching my stomach too much? Or do I have on the right sports bra so I'm not made fun of? Or 
you know, for me, I was a, I was like a 1% body fat kid my whole life. I had no fat. I was all muscle, like no matter how hard I tried. And so it was like, do I look too buff? Uh, like, am, do I have too much muscle? And so I think that I'd really like to understand from you all um, how you dealt with the mental pressures of being accepted accepted and being attractive and what advice you would give to coaches and parents out there right now about those those two things I think that's a that's a great point I you know I don't know sugar do you want to jump in here I think that you know and it's funny when you say that Odessa because I think different sports bring different elements of that right and sometimes it depends on how other people view that sport. Is that sport more of a masculine sport or is that sport acceptable for girls to be playing? Um, I think some of that plays into, you know, that, that acceptance and that love of self and how am I received visually? if that makes sense. And I, I guess what I'm, what is important to, to point out though, is that your coaches, your teammates, your parents, they're a part of the tribe. Mm -hmm. So if we're going out to perform, we know that you're going to be judged. We're never going to live in a society that doesn't you're judge not. you or doesn't try to define what woman is and doesn't try to define what man is. That's just nature, right? That's what people do. But I think it's super important for me to be mentally right and walk out and compete and not worry about somebody seeing my love handles or worried about how much I jiggle, but, but draining jump shots or running people over on the field. I need my tribe to be right. I need my coach I need to know that my coach isn't worried about my jiggle. I need to know that my teammates aren't worried about how my pants fit. And so for me, it's I think that's super important that we focus on how the tribe accepts, accepts you. Um, I definitely agree that having a group of people who are dealing with something similar to you, it's definitely helped me with like dealing with the pressure that comes with being an athlete and having to wear these uniforms that made me feel really cute that made me feel really insecure and just knowing that I wasn't alone um, and that I was surrounded by supportive and encouraging people who would never judge me for anything that I do or for anything for any part of me it just brought me a lot of comfort and reassurance um, and definitely having conversations about it too because up until the October um, podcast that I did with up to us sports um, I didn't know that we had all these things in common and all these opinions um, about the differences in girls and boys sports and like the uniforms and how we all wanted to play football, but we couldn't, we didn't, we felt like we couldn't do it because um, of like the, what's it called, like the masculinity aspect of it and misogyny that comes with the football team um, onto, onto girls, um, at least at my school <laughs> and all my other teammates schools as well, but yeah yeah Odessa I think that's such a uh, such an important point because as a former athlete like I never wanted to go out on the field and have someone be like "Ooh, that uniform looks so good on her like that's not why I was going out on the field that wasn't the point for me to be like having a fashion show at midfield being like how does this look guys how about if I look over how about that's not why I was out there that's not why any of us go on the field is to look good in clothing that wasn't designed to fit every body type like we go out there because we're good at the things we're doing out there and so what I am continuing to work on because for luckily um at the age group that I'm working on like these ideas of body type at least with the group of girls that I work with haven't set in yet and so for me to be able to at this young age try and keep pushing that like when you step out on that field it's not about how you look it's not about whether these shorts hug your thighs or whether it's too tight on your shoulders what matters when you step out on the field is that you're doing something that you love and you're doing it well and that's what you should be confident about and that's what you should be embracing and so to get in early I think is really important in trying to establish that confidence doesn't come from the way that your uniform fits. Confidence comes from how, what you do in that uniform. So how do you balance that though? I'm sorry, go ahead, Odessa. I didn't even want to say something. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that the, 
the the sport too, right? Because I think like, and I played I played team sports and basketball and and football where the different position types generally had different body types. Mm -hmm. And so like in football, what like what I tried to do is help women and girls realize that every body type matters. You can't play football with just 110 pound women or girls, you're gonna lose. You're gonna get mopped up off the floor. And so like in my team, we have a bunch of 300 pound women. And for the first time in some of their lives, they're in their twenties and thirties. And for the first time in some of their lives, they have a coat in, in Texas, we call them BOGs, big old girls. And at first they go, like you say big and it's like, that's bad. But by the time we get to the end of practice, everybody wants a BOG tattoo because of what it means in football uh, that you play on the line of scrimmage. You are one of the most valuable people on the field. And so I think it's, you know, it's also position wise. How do you talk to your post players? What terms do you use when you're saying those things to them? And how do you make them comfortable with what they are? Like, don't try to hide. If you're big, you're big. Um, but I think it's all about the, the work to back to Molly's point. It's the words you use, right. Um, and how, how it will be accepted. Cause I need you to help me accept me yeah. if I'm in your tribe. Yeah. So, and what I was going to say is how, do, how do coaches and sugar, I want to hear from you from the, from the college perspective, how do coaches do that? Right. Especially college coaches who, you know, their jobs are their livelihoods and they're trying to bring in talent and they want girls to be fit and they want their athletes to be a certain weight or a certain size to play a certain position. So how do you balance that? How does a coach, Sugar, balance something like that? I wanna get the most out of you, so I want you to train or I want you to drop some weight without projecting that onto a young girl or a young woman and make her feel like somehow I'm not good enough or somehow um, I can't be accepted because of how I look. There's a difference between what it looks like and what the service is. Like you said, Odessa, what it's serving. Um, what do coaches need to be doing at that level to make sure that girls understand that this is not an aesthetic thing. This is not about how you look. It's about a performance thing. I think you for me, it was just more like positive reinforcement. I mean, in the like professional world, you have, you have body shaming, you have, you know, them sexualizing. Yeah. You got to look a certain way. You got to be a certain, um, you got to wear a certain amount. And that's because they're trying to sell a certain product. But I found it just over the years, like having that support system, even at home. And I know I understand like a lot of people don't have that. And I didn't have that as well. It's just the relationships I built outside of home. Um, so with my coaches, um, teachers, just of that nature, um, you just kind of got to be comfortable in who you are. So you have to do a lot of soul searching um, for me. And um, I know trust is a big thing, but you have to be able to trust people as well. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a great point. I, I just don't know how we, we get it internally, right? <laughs> the sports world gets it, athletes and coaches and, and all that, we get it. But then there's external people like media and all of that who still don't get it. And quite honestly, I don't know that they really care to get it because they've got to make money and they've got to do what they do. So I, my concern is always for girls, how do we help them separate that and understand that there's a business of that and then there's a business of you taking care of yourself. Um, and and I, I just always want to know how we do that better, how we prepare our girls better for all of it. Because um, I don't know that all of that is going to go away. The media pressure and all of that is going to go away. Yeah, but we're the ones who are buying it. So I know the media pressure isn't going to uh -huh. go away, but the media pressure comes from the consuming public. Sure. So I think that the more that we teach our girls, like it might be lost on some of us who are older and on our ways out, but it won't be lost on the next. Are you saying me, Odessa? Are you trying to say I'm old? <laughs> but no, I'm just saying.
saying like, I think that women and girls are a $15 trillion consumer. Like we are already empowered with our dollar, with our viewing eye. And I think the world is changing, right? Some of the social uprisings that have happened have literally changed how brands market themselves. Right. It's no longer acceptable for a brand to come out and, and not have a stance on diversity, equity, inclusion, and those kind of things. Sure. Who's to say that that can't be the same thing on what attraction and beauty is? Sure. Right? Some of these brands are actually financially doing better because they're getting more brown and getting more black in their marketing. They're changing what their standard of beauty is. So I actually challenge us um, to make them change because charity, as awesome as it is, doesn't necessarily affect change. You have to, you have to empower yourself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think that it, it's going to take more than conversation. It's going to take, what do we buy? Like we can't, if, if it, if it doesn't represent us, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Yeah. If, yeah. It, if it sexualizes us, don't, don't buy it. Buying it. I think it really relates back to something Molly said earlier, where she said like, there's a whole business in making girls feel bad about themselves. And it's a whole industry of making people feel like they have to fit this certain mold. And so as Odessa is saying, like, throw your money where your mouth is. If a brand is making you feel bad, why are you buying that brand? That's just trying to make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that you understand that and that we all understand that we have a certain market power and the ability to throw our weight as an entire purchasing body behind brands that we believe in and then brands that are actually in the business of making girls feel good and making girls feel powerful and strong and confident regardless of what they look like. I just want to add that different is beauty. And I've always mentioned this to my girls, you know, I had girls, like I said, from little to big, I had the ones that, that will never change their uniform. They will play in the same one till the season was over. And I saw every grass, you know, you know, stain, everything you can imagine, their water stain, their Gatorade straight, everything. And I will see the ones that I wish I added like very, very neat and clean. They scrubbed good, you know, they're ready for a new game. And then I had girls that, we're always just cute no matter what. They try to be cuter in the uniform. And you know, you know, I had girls will be like, oh man, she's too cute. Oh my God, it's so annoying. But I'll be like, is they'll say, We're, we don't fit in. No, different is beauty. And you gotta understand that. And I'm gonna tell you, she looks cute. She wants to look cuter. I'm gonna make her look cuter when she starts running right now. Then she's gonna look cute, you know? So I think it starts, you know, glad you wanna say what some of our coaches, you know, it starts with us because they look up to us and we gotta be physically, mentally correct to be able to help them at the same time. So I think, you know, different is beautiful. So, and I, I wanna add too, we kind of expect sometimes like the bigger, I always been the tallest girl ever growing up. I always had to look down at my friends and it's kind of funny cause they expect them more from me. Like, oh, there goes my she, you know, she's gonna do this, oh big, cause she's, you know, taller. And I tell them size doesn't matter, trust me, I know. So, you know, I just, that's what I wanted to put input. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to piggyback right off of something Dr. Hanna mentioned earlier. Um, and I, I want to direct this question towards you guys as adults, um, whether or not you guys still struggle with body image issues. And I feel like as a teenager, hearing that I'm not alone in this and that what I feel isn't out abnormal and it's, like we it's been designed for us to feel so scared about talking about it as if we were going to be looked down on for feeling this way about ourselves as if we didn't have self-respect for um self-respect or self-love and i feel like when coaches are transparent or adults professional athletes are transparent about this um even though it might come off as like oh it's something you're still going to struggle i feel like um it's more of knowing that you're not alone rather than it's something you're never going to get over. I feel like that's something that I want to highlight and ask you guys um, to speak more on about if that's, if that's okay. But yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I struggle still, Molly, um, as someone much older than you. Um, I still struggle, not struggle in terms of 
in comparison to someone else. Um, I don't think I've ever done that. That's never been me, but that's because of how my mother and my father raised me that I never really measured myself based on anyone else. It was always based on me. Um, but my struggle as, again, as a mother who's had two kids and all that, sometimes I still struggle with body image and stuff based on what I used to look like, right? <laughs> Those of us who have kids kind of know that. It's like when I look back at what I looked like when I was your age or what I looked like um, pre-kids, um, that's where I still struggle, where I say, man, my stomach, I used to have that six pack. I used to feel more fit. Um, and now I don't, but it's never a comparison to anybody else. And that's what I hope that, that girls understand that if you just want to be better, be better. That's fine. If you say, Hey, I want to feel better, feel better. Um, but don't ever gauge it based on what somebody else looks like or based on what someone else is doing. And so I try my hardest not to do that, but yeah, the struggle is still there. I'd love to have the stomach that I had prior to having kids, but we're going to let that one go. That one's gone. <laughs> and I'm all right with it. And I'm all right with it. <laughs> yeah, no, for me, that was definitely, it's, it is definitely an ongoing struggle. And it was something that has changed over the years, I think, in terms of what I was struggling with. In high school, it was definitely like comparing myself to other girls that I thought were pretty and I wasn't pretty. And I, why don't I look like that? Why doesn't my body look like that? Why can't I wear the clothes that they're wearing and have them look just as good? And that was all the time for me in high school, very constantly. Um, and then as I got older, it kind of shifted and now the struggle is much more along the lines of like, am I healthy? Am I doing what's right for my body? Because healthy looks different for everyone. And so what I think I've come to this lovely development arc that I'm on, I think that change has happened slowly over time with realizing that what's important for me and what's healthy for me looks different. And it looks different from the person down the street, it looks different from the woman who's on the treadmill next to me. And I think that coming to that realization has been so immensely helpful in my journey to just like loving myself for the way that I am and appreciating that like this body does everything for me. And that's something to be very grateful for. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll chime in here. I think that it's a really good question to ask and um, I think if we are being really authentic, that it's something you never stop asking yourself, right? You never stop uh, thinking about, um, am, I, am I okay with me? And so for me, I recently had a situation where I'm, I'm a very self-confident person. Um, I, my mother uh, told me I was beautiful all the time and I, I believed her. And so when I went out and played and went to things and people either called me ugly or said, I like, I was shocked. I was like, who, who are they talking about? Like, I have no idea because my mom always emphasized it to me. But I was recently uh, on the world famous breakfast club and I was uh, on the video and all of these comments start coming out about how I was a man and how ugly I was. And it was the first time in the long time where I had to go like, am I good with me? Like, am I okay with my authentic self? I don't, ha I haven't had hair since I was 18. I'm a bald head woman. Like I had to go through all of those things that I probably haven't gone through since I was like seven, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, yeah, you as, as a woman and as a public figure and as an athlete, you still, I still deal with the idea of my own body image, but I will tell you 100% um, that I always come back to the fact that anybody's issues with my beauty are theirs and my acceptance of my beauty is mine. Mm -hmm. And it, you need to learn that now and because nothing is going to stop people from judging you and deciding whether you're beautiful or not. The sooner you believe it um, and it becomes like engraved in you, the easier your life is gonna be. 
I actually, the last fall season, I had one of my players come up to me very early on a Saturday morning and she went, Coach Sydney, you look really ugly today. And it took me a moment. I was like, oh, I haven't been called ugly in years. And, and it took me a split second for me to turn around. And then I looked at her and I like kind of got down as you do with youth kids. And I said, and why does that matter? Right now, why does that matter? And she looked at me like, so confused like I had just explained the theory of gravity to her and she's like what what do you mean it always matters and I was like no it doesn't we're here to play soccer why does it matter what I look like right now and she was like I, I guess it doesn't and I was like exactly now go run two laps for calling me ugly <laughs> No, I love that. I love that. Sugar, what about you? Because you're, again, you're playing. You are in the midst of playing professionally. And so, you know, that that's always a different element. You know what I mean? It's like Sydney and Odessa and Violet, we're all sort of in different levels. You're in the midst of the highest level of play. So what is that like for you right now? That self-acceptance, that where am I with who I am? I can say recently, like I've been struggling in quarantine with weight mm -hmm. and um, knowing like when the season start, let's just say I need to be at 160. Mm -hmm. Well, right now I'm at 175 and I've been 155, mm -hmm. but I found like love in myself. So I call it my love weight. So whatever weight that I feel love, mm -hmm. that's the weight that I'm going to play at. Um, mm -hmm. Because the coach is always like, oh, you need to be this, the trainers. I'm like, no, I need to love myself mm -hmm. and play at this weight and have confidence in this weight. As long as I come in shape, like nobody should question my weight. Um, yeah. But that's always going to be a struggle, um, no matter how old you get, like no matter how young or old. No, I love that. I, I love how you put that, that, you know, no matter where I am, I'm love where I am. Um, and, and I think that's a, a key lesson, especially for younger girls coming up, is to, to have this ex acceptance of self, right? And this love for self. And that is above all else, regardless of what anybody else thinks or says about you, is that you have to be good with you and, um, and, and not let anyone project their stuff, right, Odessa, like you mentioned, that whatever you think about me and however you see me, that's your stuff. That doesn't have anything to do with me because I see it very exact opposite. When I first met Odessa, I saw this beautiful, powerful, intelligent woman. That was my vision of her. However, I will say this, Anyone who sees Odessa as not being attractive is seeing a reflection of themselves. And that's what I always have to keep in mind is that if that's what you see back, then that's the reflection of you. That's what you see in yourself because there's no way that you can look at Odessa. If you feel good about you and who you are and how you look and how you show up, there's no way that you look at someone like Odessa, someone like Molly, someone like Sydney, and say, I view this person as unattractive. It's not possible when you work on yourself, truly. I'm with you, girl. I, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. Trust me. No, so the one thing, though, that uh, Sugar, you, you pointed on and that I want to stop on because I think it's huge in sports is we are critiqued a lot right? And get back to the mental health piece of this. We're critiqued a lot. It's natural for you to be booed, heckled. It's a part of every game, right? Um, coming down hard on you, even your coaches, your teammates. Uh, sometimes we play mental games with each other. We're like, I'm going to tear this athlete down today so that she can give me more tomorrow. He can give me more tomorrow. I, I want to stop on this concept of self-love because I don't think it gets enough attention, especially for us as athletes. Um, this one I've never had a, a fight with myself. And, and I want everybody to think about that. Like, I never talk bad to me. It's the one thing you can control. If I need a pep talk, it's going to be me first because the rest of the world is going to always give you, you got something negative coming. But I think it's super important that one of the coping mechanisms that we all sort of talk through is just never be bad with you. Like always have a good relationship with yourself. 
Um, and that'll start. So I, I'd like to know what's everybody's sort of way to make sure that you're good with you and, and like, what can you share with others out there who might not know how to do it? For me, it's my rule, my personal rule is that I'm never gonna be the one that has a bad relationship with Odessa. If it's gonna be anybody, it's gonna be somebody else. But to me, I'm on, I love me some me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, I love that. Oh, I, I'll, I'll jump in and start. I, you know, I used to do some um, sports psychology and mental training, perform, mental performance training with athletes a few years ago when I was in Dallas, Odessa. And one of the things that I used to tell girls is because that self-talk, like you said, that what we say to ourselves is so critical. Those conversations we have with ourselves are so critical. And so I used to ask girls who would beat up on themselves within their sport, right? Um, and get down on themselves and cut, because girls can, can say some nasty, we can say some nasty things to ourselves about who we are and what we do. Um, and um, I had a girl list out, what are those things you say to yourself when you're in the midst of a game and you mess up? What are those things that you say to, each, to yourself? She wrote them out. And I said, so let me ask you a question. Would you ever say those things to your teammate? She's like, oh, God, no. God, no, I would never do that. Okay. Would you ever allow your teammates to say that to you? No, no way. I'd go off. Okay, then why is it okay? Why is it okay for you to have that type of dialogue with yourself, right? It's not. If it's not, if it's not okay outside of you, it's not okay internally. And so that's what I try to stay, you know, I try to teach myself that on a regular basis. And again, it's a work in progress, Molly. I'm by no means am I done. <laughs> but um, I try to tell myself that, but I also tell that to girls that I coach and my daughters and all of that. If you wouldn't say it to somebody else and you wouldn't allow someone else to say it to you, then it's not all right to say it to yourself. Um, and that's just sort of a guiding principle. That is good. <laughs> I think something that I, I've done in terms of trying to facilitate better self-talk, especially for young girls, is something that I always try and do at the end of games when I see a player has clearly been upset with themselves, clearly needs a moment. Um, I try and reframe that thinking because when we say like, I suck at passing. I stink at shooting. I'm a terrible soccer player. All of those things are like, sure, that's your initial knee jerk reaction. But then I want you to take a step back, take a breath and reframe it into what, what about that am I trying to improve upon? I'm a terrible passer. Frame that into, I'm going to work on passing. I'm going to make more accurate passes. I'm going to be a better shooter next week. And those are the and frame those really sucky, terrible thoughts into goals that you can be working on because then you're not saying that you're a terrible soccer player. You're always going to be terrible. You're saying, I am a work in progress and I am slowly going to get better as long as I work towards those goals. So taking a moment as a coach to try and say, listen, we're going to reframe this mindset because this mindset's not working and we are going to go and we're going to work on goals rather than negative self-talk. And that is so true because when I get out there and I hear girls saying like, oh, I suck at this, I can't do this, you know, whatever it is, I tell them, you got to be a bigger loser to be the bigger winner. You got to learn how to lose. Not only that, every time you do something wrong from a mistake, you got to learn that it's a learning process. You learn something because next time you won't be doing that mistake again. So you got to learn from it. You got to accept it and learn from it and keep on pushing, you know, and you know, as girls, we could be, you know, a little mean with each other. Like you say, like girls could be like, oh, well, she sucks or this or that, you know, and, and it's like, no, because when you do something wrong, well, you want me as soon as you come in to say, oh, you suck. You didn't do that, right? No. And I let my girls know right away. However you treat, I will let you know. I'll give you a little taste of your medicine so you can know how it feels because we're a team. If we lost, we lost together. And guess what? I take a, a accountable for it because I told her to swing on that one. So it's my fault too, you know what I mean? So I tell them, we're a group. And the faster you guys learn that we're a group, we're gonna be the biggest winners. Even if we don't make first place, second place, third place, we're gonna be the biggest winners because we're gonna get a bond that no one's gonna be able to take away from us. And that's what, you know, 
I hope, you know, there's, there's more of that. We need more bond into these girls, you know? I think a common thing that everybody keeps saying is self-talk and, you know, just positive words of affirmation. I've had to use that, you know, with myself of just having a bad game and just saying, look, you did, you did your best today and that's all you could do. And um, just staying with that positive reinforcement, um, I think has been great over, you know, my career of just playing sports. Molly, what about you? You want to chime in? Do you have some words of wisdom for everyone? We're, we're, we're coming up on closing. I told you all this was going to go really fast. These conversations we get in and before you know it, we're ending. But, um, you know, Molly, again, as our, as our youngest person on the panel, and I think that as girls are going to listen to this um, and take heed of anybody they're going to listen to, I certainly think it probably will be you because you're relatable. Um, because you are going through what they're going through. And so if you want to take us out on some words of wisdom on how you, you keep that positive mindset, how you work on your own mental health um, and make sure that you're loving you, um, let's hear from you. Um, something that I've been recently doing is telling myself is I'm the only person who has me forever. Like till the end of time, I can always know that I will still be here for myself and this is the only body that I have and I need to take care of it in order to be strong and to be the happy that I can be that's on me and I shouldn't be able to I shouldn't solely depend on someone else or other people for that um for that validation and just always telling myself that you have to take care of yourself in order for you to come to your highest self and to be the best that you can be not for other people, but for yourself, most importantly. Um, it's your body, it's your, it's the one that you're gonna be with forever. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm, I always try to tell myself and remind myself because it does slip away a lot, but feeling comfort and being content with knowing that it's not gonna always be there, like that mindset, it's always gonna be a learning process and you're always gonna grow from it. And when you allow yourself to reflect and be aware of where you are, no matter how low you are, how high you are, there's always going to be room for growth and you're never going to stop as long as you don't let yourself stop. So. <laughs> awesome. Perfectly said, perfectly said. I appreciate that. Um, does anybody else have any parting words before we you know, dip out of here. And, and Molly, it's perfect that you said that about this sort of how do you take care of yourself? Because well, when we finish up here, I'm going to have some parting words, but we're going to have Coach D. Williams come on, who's going to do a guided meditation for us um, to kind of take us out and just get into that space. I think it's one of those practices that we as women need to do more often. Um, because that's how we get in touch with who we are as people. That's how we get in touch with not everybody else, but get in touch with your higher power, whoever that may be, that is the one that guides who you are as a person. Um, and so, um, like I said in a minute, Coach D is going to jump on here and do a meditation with us. But um, I, I think that's a, a, a perfect segue. But yeah, if any of you ladies have anything that you want to any parting words that you want to give us? I just want to go to Violetta's practices. I want, I want, I know, I want right? to know what you got going on. Like, <laughs> that energy. Anytime. Anytime. I want to be up with there. I think yeah. my girls will be inspired by you too. Yeah. Just, you know, I want to thank you all. You know, you guys are all powerful, beautiful women, and I'm glad to be a part of this. Molly, keep on doing what you're doing, girl. It's inspiring to see someone so young, you know, and Odessa, man, anytime you're in my field, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. This was fun. Um, like I said, great conversation, um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, um, and, and hopefully our viewers um, just really gravitate to the words that you all have put out there and hopefully um, recognize the beauty in themselves um, from this day forward if they haven't done so already. Uh, so thank you, uh, Miss Violetta Aguilera, Molly Pham, Sydney Park, Odessa Jenkins, and Sugar Rogers. 
I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, if uh, Quick note before we bring Coach D in, um, for all of you at home who are viewing, we're all wearing She Changes the Game t-shirts, um, which was designed by our very own Kimberly DeGacero, part of the uh, part of our marketing team, um, you can purchase these shirts. So Jacqueline is gonna put in the chat where you can go to purchase the shirts if you wanna get one. All the funds will go directly towards our She Changes the Game initiative, which is focused on the importance of growing opportunities for women in, um, for women to coach and also ensuring that young girls in vulnerable com communities have access to sports. Um, so yeah, get your t-shirt, support us, um, do what you can. We're also going to, um, I also want to remind you of our partnership with Adidas was around creating a digital curriculum around keeping girls in sport. So you can visit keepgirlsinsport.com and take that digital curriculum. It's a free curriculum. Um, have your coaches and your organizations take that curriculum. Um, and then also what we're going to do right before Coach D comes on is we're going to play a video about our um, 100 Women Giving campaign. Again, we're trying to um, develop all of these ideas and, and uh, activities around keeping women and girls in sports and making sure that we're showing up as coaches and that we're getting um, a seat at the table and that we're making decisions when it comes to girls playing in sports and women. Um, being involved in sports. And so, um, so right now, what we're going to do, I'm going to have Kimberly go ahead and, and play our 100 Women Giving video. Hey, it's your girl Colette V. Smith here, the first Black woman to have ever coached in the history of the National Football League, the first female to have ever coached in New York Jets franchise, history, the founder and president of Believe in You Incorporated and proud Up To Us Sports ambassador. I'm teaming up with Up To Us Sports to level the playing field for young girls. We're looking to put more women coaches on the ground to lead girls in sports through our She Changes the Game initiative, giving opportunities for young women and girls to develop important life skills. Leadership in sports means leadership for life. I'm asking, we're asking you to please support Up To Us Sports and our 100 Women Giving campaign, which means we're looking for 100 women to contribute just $500 annually for the next three years. Together, we will increase opportunities for girls to play and women to coach. We're stronger together. Come on, guys. Let's go. Awesome, awesome. Um, so I wanna give a special thank you to the women who have supported our 100 Women Giving through either financial contributions, building connections, um, and also with their time and effort. And certainly we wanna thank Colette B. Smith for that, for that announcement. Um, Paul Kakamo, Lori Schweitzer, Meredith Geisler, Melinda Maxfield, Ann Beth Stebbins, Sue Partelli, Amy Waters, and Christy Wood. Um, also, uh, I'm sorry, Christy Wood-Smith, Pam Shriver, Abby McKenna, Angela LaChica, Marcy Kakamo, um, and yeah, so thank you, thank you, thank you. If you know of any women who would be interested in our campaign, please let them know, have them get in contact with us, and we'd be happy to include them in the 100 Women Giving. Um, so. Without any further ado, I mentioned before that we were going to bring in Coach D. Williams. Um, Coach D, are you here with us? I see you. There we are. There's Coach D. Hey, Coach D. Um, Coach D is the founder of Get Fit, Fly Right. Um, she has some background and specialty about mental wellness and what we need to do to be taking care of ourselves. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Come on in, Coach D. I want you to talk a little bit about yourself and what you do. And then we're going to take about 10 minutes to do a guided meditation. Oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I'm always that person, I promise you. <laughs> Every time I see the progressive commercial, I feel attacked. Um, 
many blessings. Uh, I am just so honored to be here in the presence of so many strong and very articulate women. I was sitting in here just snapping and oh girl and yes, <laughs> I wish I had like a collection plate. I would just throw it at all of you um, because the message was just so powerful and profound um, and also for me, very affirming. Uh, mental health is now kind of trendy. And for me, um, it's something that started 12 years ago. Um, and so I'm like, oh, you, you guys caught up? Hey, y'all. <laughs> um, and so today, what I heard and I thought was super profound, thank you, Molly, for uh, just your level of vulnerability today. Uh, I'm a big Nipsey Hussle fan. And so just the other day, I was um, privy to a meme where he was talking about what inspired something that inspired him the most. And the quote that he used was, would you rather be at peace with the world and at war with yourself or at war with the world and at peace with yourself? And I think that's a question that a lot of us, you know, especially during the pandemic and dealing with just rapid change had to really ask ourselves, who do we wanna be at war with and who do we wanna be at peace with? And so in listening to everyone speak, I know for me what has been just very crucial uh, and insurmountable really in my own evolution is my language. And I think for um, a lot of us, uh, Sugar Robert, you said, you, Rogers, excuse me, you said it best, we're in survival mode and changing that language. For myself, uh, being from Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, I went from saying struggle to journey. Uh, in basketball, you're taught, yeah, I love the process. And sometimes it is a struggle. Um, however, when you're with your friends, uh, you're with trusted supports, it becomes a journey. Um, I think about just being in high school and having to like walk home because the bus was too crowded. It never seemed long because I was with my friends. And so when we put ourselves in a mental space to accept the journey, accept the, the changes that will always happen, uh, it, it just seems like an easier, even more funner ride. I know the ride may be bumpy, but I'd rather it be fun than it be scary. And so uh, that was just something that was really, really on my heart that I thought you all spoke about so eloquently, the way that we talk to ourselves, the way that we listen and the way that we hear and receive others. Um, Odessa, I thought it was so powerful. Um, I also was like confused as a child because I like to wear my hats. I like to show my arms. And for me, it was, you're too pretty for that. What, what does that mean? And so I, I shunned wanting to be a girl because it was too much pressure. It was too much pressure to be what you liked when I didn't like none of that. Um, and so for me, it, it was learning that, hey, everyone's not going to like you. Everyone's not going to um, want what you want for yourself. Um, and you know, you get to choose who you fight with. And so the journey is never ending. And for me, once I learned that and accepted that, okay, my body's gonna change. Uh, something that I often say to a lot of my players is my best looks different. Um, I thought it was so powerful, Coach, uh, when you were talking about letting the, the youth and the players know that um, we need we need you. We The coaches need the players just as much as the players need the coaches. That even exchange is so, so important. And the more that coaches are vulnerable enough to share that, I think the better that the sport experience can be for everyone, regardless of what sport you play. And so that brings me into what I do. Uh, Coach D. Williams of Get Fit Fly Right. I am from uh, Brooklyn, New York. And my goal has really been to train coaches. I'm, <laughs> I'm the, um, the elephant in the room that's saying, hey, coach, it's not them, it's us. Uh, I'm a firm believer that attitude is a reflection of leadership. And so self-awareness is what I preach. It's what I teach. And it's the strategies that I've created. So that way, coaches are not just a... Um, an example, but they are a visible representation of the work that the youth get to do and the players get to do. And so with that being said, I was um, blasted away um, is the only word I can use. I literally feel like I was a rocket being blasted into space. I went to a Buddhist uh, meditation class when I attended Fordham and my professor would always say, you can't skip to the end. And I'm one of those readers where I read the front page, the middle page, and the back of the book. <laughs> And I was like, you know, that's not um, getting me through life. Um, I had three knee surgeries. And after my mother's passing, I was like, okay, there's a lot that I need to like process and figure out. And I got heavily into breath. Uh, my mother was asthmatic and she died of C COPD. 
And so I was very interested by breath. I was like, what is this, this breath thing? And so as I got into that class, I started learning more about the way they breathe uh, to prepare for martial arts and the way singers prepare their breath and the way athletes prepare their breath, um, the way, um, I may not be getting this right, but in Hawaiian culture, when they chant and they gather in community, the way that they breathe, I was just fascinated by it. And I was like, well, how can I take this for myself um, when I feel that knock in my chest and I'm ready to fight or I'm ready to shut down and I just want to push everything away? Or, you know, as a coach, the, the beginning of game time, you leave it to your players because the only time we have control is practice. And so there was an anxiety there for me. Um, and I came up with 533. And so that is what uh, we are going to do today. 533 is a breath meditation designed specifically for athletes and performers to reinvigorate and reinvite energy and focus, bringing together the mind and the body so that the breath work in unison. And so I'm very excited to share this all with you today. And so we're gonna get right into it. Uh, the only thing that I ask is that you sit straight up. Two calming breaths just to kind of relax and ground into your space. The next thing that I ask is that you have your hands open, rested just easily on your lap. That way you can give and receive to the space. Have your eyes closed. If you prefer to keep them open, which is fine, just find one focal point to stare at. I recommend trying it with your eyes closed. Five deep breaths, you're gonna bring the nose in, the air in through your nose, out through your mouth. I want you to unclench your jaw and remove your tongue from the roof of your mouth. As we move on too fast, I want you to think of push and pull. You're going to pull the air in and push it out. Breathing in like so. Engage that diaphragm. Pushing the air out one more. On to loud in the same cadence, pulling the air in and releasing whatever it is, breathing in gratitude, releasing fear and doubt. <sighs> Again. Letting out whatever it is, breathing in gratitude, exhaling worry, fear, and doubt. <sighs> Take two calming breaths, finding your heartbeat, and come back when you are ready. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate Stay. it. Um, I think, like I said, an absolutely phenomenal way to, to end um, our, our discussion and our session today. Um, is just to get people in the space of, of self-care and taking care of yourself and knowing where you are and who you are. And so Coach D, I want to say thank you. Well, we have come to the end um, of another, again, I just, I really enjoy doing these um, virtual events. Um, it gives me an opportunity. I think it's sort of selfish on my part, maybe, that it gives me this opportunity to connect 
with women such as Coach D and, and the women that were on the panel today, um, just really amazing people um, in the spaces in which they work, in which they live. Um, so I want to give um, a special thank you to all of our national sponsors, Adidas, Allstate, AmeriCorps, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health. Um, we also wanna give a shout out to the Women's Sports Foundation for continuing to power national girls and women in sports day every year so that the nation can celebrate and inspire girls and women to play and be active and to realize their full potential. Um, you can stay up to date with what we've got going on on our website, which is up to us, um, up to us And um, you can also check out what the Women in, uh, Women's Sports Foundation um, has going on on their website. You can also follow us on, Inst on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Up to Us Sports. Um, so again, I thank you all for being here, for, uh, for just being a part of the conversation and continuing to support the work that we do here at Up to Us Sports. Have a great evening. <laughs>